<laughs> Thanks, Louise. So thank you for those of you who have added to our chat. All I wanted from everybody was to start the session with what were some of the insights that you've um, captured in your mind so far. And I've been uh, really enjoying the session so far. All of them have been great. And I, it's been lovely to see that there's been some common themes that have been woven into each of them, which I'm lucky enough at 2.15 in the afternoon to be able to pick up on, um, on some of those. So um, let's have a look at the six steps for during and post pandemic when you talk about leadership. So we, we're not out of it, we're not out of the woods, but we, I think as some of the previous, um, like Sarah and some of the previous speakers have said, we're starting to lift our heads now and seeing um, a different view. So before I tell you what the six steps are, what do you think should get on the list? So I'm keen to see what you think would get on the list. So you can type it into chat. So what should be on the list of six steps for leaders? Is that what you're asking, Kerry? What, yeah, so what, if you were designing a perfect leader for right now and over the next three years, what would that leader be about? What are some competencies? What are some of the, um, what's the profile of that person? Okay, so um, Sam's saying that we're all centered around the objective of maximizing the potential of our people, despite the various environmental challenges. Great, thank you. Servant focus, says Jade. I am reading the chat. I will always read the chat. Being clear on purpose, yes. I want two or three more and then we'll get started. Being clear on, and open on the purpose, and that um, is, um, of course, it's your North Star, which Sarah referred to earlier. Yes, I'll speak about that. Courageous. Behavior and humility. Thanks, Sarah. Yep, courage is important. Flexibility. Um, uh, Neil saying to show the way. Oh, there's so much typing. I can't keep up with you. Very, very fast typing. Um, innovation. Focusing on empathy. I love it. And feedback. Yes, not just giving it, but asking for feedback and being approachable and collaborative. Empathy comes back and trustworthy. Okay, that's great. So you've done the session, everybody. I don't really need to tell you any more, but I, I will continue now with, um, with the six steps. I'm just looking at how I can move these slides. Right, so something that's come up, Neil spoke about this at length this morning and spoke about it very well, um, and that's the idea of trust. And before we look at the six steps that I thought we would really focus on as a foundational idea and a concept, is trust. Um, so I'd like you to grab a piece of paper or a, um, a post-it note or anything next to you and write down the one name of somebody that you trust. And it can't be yourself. Please don't write your own name. So just one person, and no one needs to see this, don't type it into chat. It's the one person in your life that you trust. Put that person's name down. I'm giving you another three seconds. Two, one. Okay, now I'm going to ask you an even more provocative question, and that is, who trusts you? You see, we, we, not all of us, but there is this tendency for us to always look at who is not trustworthy, trustworthy out there, and we point fingers at people who we can't trust based on their behavior. But really, what it comes down to is, as a leader, what are you doing to instill trust by the daily rituals that you spoke about in previous sessions? that um, enable you to uh, connect with the people that, that you support and that rely on you. And there are a few things about trust that we know based on research. I wish I could go into this in more detail. Unfortunately, we've only got 45 minutes. But there are a few things that I'd like to share with you. The first thing about trust is it's very slow to build trust. And it's like, you, know, you can break it in a, in a heartbeat. Um, and it's never quite the same with people. You know, you can have a falling out and, and mend things, but there's always that crack. There's always that. I always liken it to a um, um, piece of paper that you pull out of the printer. You know, when you want just a scrap piece of paper to write something down or your kid wants to draw something, you ever so carefully lift the, the paper out of the printer and it bends and you think, oh, I just wanted a nice clean piece of paper and I've got this little kink. You can, as much as you smooth it, it'll never go away. There's always that little um, 
kink in it and it's the same in a relationship so trust is not easily rep uh, repairable the other um, idea of trust based on Cecily Cooper's research uh, she's from the University of Miami is that it's comprised of competence and character so what that means is you're good at what you know and what you've trained in so sort of things like agile and being you know able to give a presentation host a visual or a virtual meeting um, using all the software and then there's also character so based on your behavior how do you exude your values do you do you walk the talk are you um are you embodying the culture of the organization and I love this last one, Amy Edmondson, uh, second, the second last one, but she's uh, from Harvard Business School and she mentioned psychological safety, which I know was touched on in the first session this morning. And it's the place that um, breeds and engenders trust. So if without psychological trust, it's uh, psychological safety, it's impossible to have trust. The other thing we know based on Poznan Kutz's research, which is called the Leadership Challenge, which they've published fairly recently, is that it's a crucial leadership quality. In fact, when there was a um, survey um, conducted, that came up as number one. So if I mention something that you wrote down on your list, if you had it in the chat, then you can put your hand up and you can say, I had that one. Say yes in chat, so I had that one. Thanks, Kerry. Number one for the, the, the six steps is to be purposeful. So what happened when, pan, when the pandemic hit, um, there was, um, if there's an easy way to resort to, or the easiest thing was maybe a habit that people have, developed some leaders got very small and they they hunkered down um, and they honed in on very small problems like delays budgets limitations the bottom line of the business and that's not what great leaders do yes we worry about that but great leaders lift their heads up and they say you know like with your camera function on your phone you can zoom in, in and out of google maps so when you're zooming in, you can only really see what's in the neighborhood really at close proximity. But the great leaders who use the zooming out function, they can see what else is in the vicinity. They can see what the competitors are doing, what their stakeholders like sponsors or their um, consultants are up to. And when you view the landscape from a broad point of view, then you can see what alternative routes there are. Maybe there's another piece of software out there for us. Maybe there's some people we can collaborate with. It's been very interesting during the pandemic that, um, especially in the pharmaceutical industry where um, competitors have joined forces um, against a common enemy because they have been purposeful, because they keep revisiting what they're on, on the planet to do which is to find a cure, right? To find a vaccine. So it's been very interesting that they've banded together against a common threat. Um, so what can we do as leaders? What's our role in PMO? It's to get in touch with and stay in touch with your workers. So whether it's contractors or full-time workers, your sponsors, other key stakeholders. And the reason for wanting to get in touch with them when, the pan when you're sort of coming out of the pandemic, especially, is those same people gravitate towards companies whose purpose reflects their personal values and their beliefs. So we want, we want leaders like you to talk to your stakeholders often, talk to your team about your purpose, talk to your stakeholders about your purpose and your values. Work it carefully into your communication. So um, toolbox meetings, your stand-ups, your reflections, what I think is um, really important is to not be sort of staccato about it and um, rather to, to use it in ways that help you connect to other people. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do in the chat function now is to write down some of your opportunities to, to share with your stakeholders what your purpose is. So what are some of the sort of non-contrived ways that you can 
um, speak to your stakeholders about purpose or values. And I'm going to watch the chat. Yep, showcases, that's great. Making a difference, certainly, yes, Amy. So, so Amani, so when are the, um, when are some other opportunities that you have to return to purpose and revisit them with your team? You can talk to us, Amani, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I guess reinforcing the purpose can come at the start of every meeting. If you've got regular meeting on monthly or fortnightly basis, for example, that helps setting uh, the mindset as well as uh, the tone for the whole meeting in terms of what's the purpose, what are the expectations in order to ensure everyone is on the same page. Yes, exactly. That's a great way to thank somebody to, to open a meeting or certainly to um, open and address a company-wide communication that goes out. Thanks for that. Okay. So I'm just having some difficulty sharing my slides for some reason. Can you see my slides? No, we can't, no. Hmm. Okay. You do have, there yeah, go. there you go. Okay. So um, you've answered this question for me, which is great. I can move on. Now the next step is, so we've got number one, right? We've got revisit purpose. I'm going to ask you to put your cameras on. If they're off, just for a moment. And I'm not sure people can, Kerry. By all means, if you can, guys, please do. But I don't think people can do. I don't think they have that option in webinar. Do our panelists do? Panelists do. Okay. So what? In fact, this is a good opportunity for us to test our panelists. Hello, <laughs> panelists. No pressure. Can you make for me a lowercase e into the camera, like for just for me? Okay, so interesting, because a lot of people just do that. Or they'll draw it, and it's for, it, 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 when it's reflected back to me, it's backwards, by the way. <laughs> it's completely backwards. So I would need you to do something which reflects an E. It's the same as if you ask somebody to wear a post-it note and put it, make it a lowercase e. And the, the idea is that when we communicate, we like to think about, how might, how might this message land with me? But in fact, we need to think about other people. And that's what we call empathy. And this word has come up again and again today. So I want you to keep this very practical and sort of conversational because your team needs you to support them um, and especially the most vulnerable. And, and I think it was Nicola who said this morning, you know, you know your team. Um, and we all know what our, the baseline of all our team members is if we, if we have developed a relationship with them over the last few years. And we know when they're having an off day, when they're off their baseline, we call it. So I hope this is not what, um, your, what empathy looks like in your PMO, but it, this can happen. So here's a conversation uh, that a leader may have with a worker. Hey. You've fallen behind on the last three milestones. This could be a phone call or a Zoom meeting. We've had this conversation before. If you don't pick up your game for the next deadline, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to say anything. You know. Now, there's a problem with version A. I haven't put version A, but here's version B. How different is this? Hey, you've fallen behind on the last three milestones. We've had this conversation before. Are you okay? What's going on? I'm a little bit worried about you. So this is, and somebody mentioned earlier, this is a difference in wording. It's a, different, a difference in tone of voice. Not, hey, you've fallen behind. What's up? It's, hey, you've fallen behind. You're okay. In scenario B, this leader shows empathy. 
because at the heart of empathy is curiosity. Can you see these questions? Are you okay? What's going on? Empathy requires curiosity. If we don't show that we are really curious about the situation, we are not in a position to ever help them. So in this example, the assumption is not that the person is the problem. It is that the person has a problem. And that if we can help them professionally or even personally, provide them with a safe space to talk as a human being, we may even be able to support them or help them. Empathy is about seeing people um, as just that. You know, we are all we all go through tough times. We go through times of elation. We get a, we get a, um, a lucky break. We have disappointments. We have family problems. We are all just a big bunch of human mess. All of us, you know, with respect, we are all going through <laughs> a lot of stuff, highs and lows, especially now. Leaders get that. Great leaders just seem to get that and they accept it and they take care of the people because if they take care of the people, then the people take care of the results. Leaders are not focused only on the results, they are focused on what is and who is driving those results. So empathy is crucial. Well done for those of you who listed empathy. Who had communication? Woohoo! So what we talk about is, um, and we talk about this in our uh, face-to-face -face communication workshops and also in a virtual communication work workshop, how important it is to communicate calmly and clearly and simply. And the last one is, over, is really underrated. Simple communication is underrated. And I say this because people right now are looking for clarity. There's so much, what I said was called VUCA, but it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. People don't know exactly what's coming around the corner. We have, we have we're sensitive to it, we, we, are, we have our feelers out, but no one can really pinpoint exactly what is going to happen at such and such a time. So people are looking to us in our PMOs for that clarity, and they need us to communicate in a calm way and in a clear way. So, so what does this mean for, for um, a, 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 a leader at a PMO? So what can I do? Well, not this. Can I love Dilbert. This is really a bad example of clear communication. Um, we, we don't, you know, people don't like to find out via osmosis, I call it. Um, we've, we don't have the water cooler talk anymore. Um, we have trying to find creative ways to connect with people virtually. Um, and so what people are looking to us to offer them is uh, authenticity. So when we speak at a stand-up, when we speak at, 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 during a Zoom meeting, at the, we, we just need to come across as real people. Yeah, so people hate that residue oh, this person's just, they're just putting this on um, or they're saying something, but I really know something else is going on. There's nothing better than knowing that you are getting what you are seeing, whether it's through a screen or through a phone, you know, a phone screen or a, or a computer screen or over the phone. We also need to keep our email simple, our papers that we send out simple, um, any memos, any documents that we send out and any uh, verbal communication simple. Uh, and, and also what people love is to have a good story. And I think we lose out on stories online because we, you know, and, and, I, and I understand and I accept and appreciate 15 minute meetings, but then make separate times for these sort of failure stories, you know, so we, so we learn from that. What's the story behind that failure? And can we learn? People learn really well and effectively through storytelling. So can we bring a story that, uh, demonstrates how he was successful. Can we bring a story that demonstrates where we sort of fell off the wagon and what we can do differently? Nobody doesn't love a good story. And also great leaders communicate uh, in a futuristic way. So we talk about what is on the horizon. We talk about the North Star. We talk about things that are in the future and about to happen because it's motivating. People can see that you are not just stuck in today. You are planning. You're a visionary you're thinking 
um, not outside the box, the box is too small. You're thinking outside the building, you're thinking outside the state. Who had resilience? Give yourselves a high five if you had a resilience, a word about um, even agility, yeah? Because that is what it is. So can I ask a question? How much resilience do leaders need? Like, is there a number? Can someone quantify it for me? I need a number. Who knows how much we need? <laughs> five out of five, a ton, endless, yes. Well, it's not fair that I asked that question because it's the wrong question, isn't it? And I hate when people ask trick questions, but I just did that. You just need enough to bounce back, Neil, yeah? You need enough to bounce back and then you need to have a break. You need to have a break from the pressure and then you come back stronger. So something which I, I think I wrote it, an Instagram post the other day or something, uh, it was something, that resilience is not something that you, are, you have a finite amount of, it's like a muscle, you need to work it out. You, need, you need, really need to, to work out with resilience. And so um, I thought I would share with you a really good tool, I love tools, um, that Martin Seligman shared. He's one of the most world-renowned psychological experts. He's the guru. And he has what we call the optimism and pessimism continuum. And, and if you've got a piece of paper, whip it out and start drawing, it, you can make an exact version of what I've got on the screen. And I'd love you to plot yourself, little point, uh, where you land. So Seligman says that there are three P's of resilience. And based on how we um, rate ourselves in terms of permanence, pervasiveness, and personalization will give us a worldview that's either optimistic or pessimistic. And so the people who are, who are what we call resilient um, or agile fit have um, an optimistic worldview, of course, and they can weather the storm. And this is a storm everyone this is and i somebody said to me the other day we're all in the same boat and i said no we are not everyone is experiencing this very differently and our baseline is very different and i went all psycho babble but i said you know what actually we are all in the same storm but we're in different boats so i would love if you had um, a go with this so if you think let's think of okay the pandemic as our sort of context for this and you are more than welcome to do this as an exercise with your team, is to plot yourself in terms of how you view whether it's temporary or permanent. Is COVID-19, is this pandemic, this sort of crisis permanent? Well, it's not um, traffic, you know, because that's the classic example of how resilient we are. Do we yell at the driver who cut us off? Do we start white knuckling it down the freeway because we missed the light? So in terms of permanence, how permanent is this arrangement? Will they find a vaccine? Yes, it's very likely. How soon? I don't know. Maybe a few months. So based on how permanent the situation is of work from home, deal with homeschooling kids, um, having no commute, um, working at home with a partner, how permanent is that? And you can, if you view it as, you know, Optimistic or pessimistic, plot yourself. All right. The next one is pervasiveness. Um, is it, and this talks about how pervasive it is to your entire world. So your social life, your, ex, your ability to exercise and get good nutrition, um, your spiritual health, your mental health, your social, I don't know if I've mentioned your social health and your work situation. So for some people, it's pervasive like they have lost work or their work situation has changed completely and is, is devastating to them. Others think, well, I'm working at home. This is really great. I don't have to commute. I get to spend the afternoons with my children as tough it is, as it is, but I'm flexible. So I work at night. So, and I'm still able to eat good food. I'm, I'm ordering online. I'm growing vegetables in my garden. I mean, heaven knows what people get up to, but they're, you know, how pervasive 
is the pandemic for you? Plot yourself between optimism and pessimism. And the final one is personalization. So think about your situation um, in light of what's happening globally. Um, and so we know that COVID-19 is a global pandemic. It's not about you. It's affecting everybody in their boat, yes. But if we are able to say, oh, but everybody in Sydney has been, oh, and Melbourne, oh, wow, the whole of Australia and global, if we can really zoom out and see that most people in the world have been affected somehow by this, that personalization goes away. We don't think that the world's out to get us. And then we can plot ourselves closer to the optimistic worldview. So I'm keen to see how many of you actually did this and who is optimistic and who is pessimistic. Who did this? Ooh, we have an optimist person, an optimistic person. Good, Suzanne. So this is something um, that I think is, is quite cool to do with your teams. You can even copy the slide and, and show them and say, this is a, a really good resilience tool. Um, and if you know somebody's feeling a bit off their baseline, then you can say, well, you know, I, I've found this amazing tool and I think we should talk about it without being too um, prescriptive. Okay. So let's move on now. Um, and what I thought we could do was talk about you and your team. So write the question down for yourself because after the session, I'd like you to think about what you can do to help your team grow their resilience muscle. Because I'm certainly more interested in what happens when you leave this session with your team rather than what happens now. Um, I believe that you're an optimistic group. You, you are here after all listening. Um, and, and taking notes, but I'm more interested in what you plan to do with your team. So please write the question down. It, it might be something you want to discuss during a panel session or type it into chat and I'll pick it up. Now, some, some ways you can grow your resilience muscle, um, some of the experts say, and, and you know, it's impossible to do all of this every day, but sort of the 80-20 rule um, is to do as much as you can. Um, it's first of all to take care of yourself because what do they say? You can't pour from an empty jug. Uh, you need to fill yourself up with good stuff. Sleep, very underrated. Sleep, um, exercise that you enjoy, not too much, um, just enough and good nutrition. Practicing gratitude, you can do this as a team, you can do this as an, as a, in a, on a personal level, you can do it sitting around as a family. Um, and then also taking a whole world view, which is sort of that exercise that I did with you earlier, but also to be able to take a step back with your, your brain lens, your own in, uh, built in camera and say, okay, I had a bad day, but it's one day out of the week. We didn't really, we didn't meet the deadline or, you know, we, we are falling behind or I've lost a team member. It's not the end of the world if we zoom out and we take things into perspective. And then there's this wonderful story, which I'm happy for you to Google when you leave the session is um, a King Solomon story about a ring that he had inscribed and it said, so too shall this pass. And the message there is for leaders to understand that when things are good, that's gonna go. And when things are bad, that will also go away. So enjoy the good times, enjoy the good moments with your family, enjoy the good moments with your children, with your parents, with your friends, with your team, with your own manager, with your own execs, because um, things could be worse and they have been worse. Um, so take it all in and understand if you're having a really rubbish day that the next day will come. Okay, uh, Sarah spoke about this uh, in I think it was her sort of second last or third last slide was breaking things into chunks and to break it down. I mean, you guys are the experts on Gantt charts and work breakdown structures. It's the only way to climb an insurmountable mountain is to break it up and break it down into chunks. And that's also a really good tool to teach your, to your teach your, or coach your teams on is to um, what they say in Africa, how do you eat an elephant? 
one bite at a time. So some ways that you can build your team's resilience, I think that we've covered that today, but I will just cover it in very um, broad sweeps, and that's to um, harness the power of your cross-functional teams. We know that cross-functional teams are much more motivated um, because they have autonomy, they're left on to their own devices, trust levels have to be really high, and because autonomy is, um, exists, there's more um, accountability, or there should be more accountability, it's a boost for morale. Um, it, it certainly breeds in diversity um, and, 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 and actually it's a really good opportunity for your teams to practice their communication skills because they're not just um, talking to one team all the time. They are mixing with different personalities all the time. And of course, it's the way forward for innovation because of the, div the diversity and, the, um, and fewer, having fewer restraints. And so therefore, it inherently cross-functional teams should be more resilient. Now, when you choose your scrum masters, your leaders, your managers, choose them based on character and their temperament. These should be people who are uh, curious and um, very flexible in temperament. They, this is needed because they need to make very quick uh, and thoughtful decisions without you. Now, I'm going to ask you to type. I know this looks very strange. What do you see? Oh, someone's already on it. I won't judge you. Just say anything. I see a man. What else do you see? I've had all sorts of things. You can't be wrong. A calf. Country. Mm, cat, light and shade. Okay, landscape, globe. Okay, so let's go back to who said it? Jillian. You said a calf. A calf is in the cow calf. You're going to have to show me that turtle then. Yes, yeah, top left. Okay, so let's, and I'm not going to tell you, I just want you to figure it out, everybody. Jillian says that she sees a calf, and the clue is that the ear is on the top left, sort of that shaded spot on the left. Can anyone else see a cow? I see it now. Sam seen the cow. Yep. Okay, Louise, you've got it. Now, for those of you who have, are still trying to see it, just some clues. A, a quarter way down the screen are two dark shadows separate to each other. Those are its ears. Who can now see it after the clues? Yep, Amani's got it. Okay, right. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Am I right? It's there forever. You're like, how did I see a turtle? Or a, what was it? An elephant. That's, so a cow. Yeah. So now the question is, those of you who've got it, you're like, oh, I've got it. I'm so good. I can see it. I can see all those things. But for the rest of you who are still trying to figure it out, are you getting annoyed? Mm, cause that's the next, that's the next of the steps is to develop a growth mindset. Hey, it's the penultimate step. And what does a growth mindset mean? Well, some of us are feeling like we will never be able to see the cow and others are like, I have to see the cow, Carrie, go back to that slide. Oh my God. I hope we get emailed this presentation because I have to figure out the cow. If you really want to figure out the cow and you're still interested in figuring out the cow, that means you have a growth mindset. For those of you who said, I couldn't care about the cow, move on. Never going to see it. Hmm. Let's talk. So there's a woman by the name of Carol Dweck. Here's Carol. Carol Dweck, about 30 years ago, she and her colleagues became very interested in students' attitudes about failure, interestingly enough. They noticed that some students really bounced back quickly and others were devastated by just a low mark or a very small setback. 
And after studying thousands of pupils' behavior, um, Dweck coined the term growth mindset, fixed mindset. And I think it's perfect for you because we talk about agility and that's what this growth mindset is sort of um, celebrating. They're not the same, but you can't have one. You cannot have a growth mind. You cannot, you know, use an, ag an agile framework without having a growth mindset. And especially if you are adapting the, the um, templates for your particular needs and you don't see them as static. That's a very interesting discussion. So um, let me talk about this in, in real terms. So I have a, um, a little, I have kids and the youngest is a really keen swimmer. He's a really good swimmer. And um, when he went to swimming lessons, he would, he would be a few yards ahead of the next kid and he'd get out the water and say, oh, that was okay. And I said, oh, you're amazing. You're a great swimmer. And, and he was, he was a very, he's a very good swimmer. And I would wrap him in his towel and we'd go home. And then he started messing around in his classes. And I don't know what was going on. I was praising him. I was saying, you're amazing. You're such a good swimmer. And you, you know, you're strong and you're brilliant. And then I read Carol Dweck's book and her research. And in it, she says, we should steer clear of praising people for their inherent brilliance or their inherent quality, you know, their strengths. Because then they stop trying. We should rather praise their efforts. Well, I, I had a very big aha moment and I thought, okay, well, I'll try it. And at the next lesson, I said to him, I, I want to see you try because you've been messing around, buddy. And I'd love to see you try. I just want to see you try really hard. And he tried. And he was, of course, much better. It was like a light bulb went off for him. He heard effort. He heard try. And suddenly he was back on track. And so it doesn't happen, doesn't work every time, especially with children. But if you take it to the adult, to the workplace, and we think about how we give feedback to people who have been tracking really well and we are doing a reflection on a project, we don't say, oh, you're brilliant and you're wonderful and you're so talented because they are. And that's why we hide them. And that's why they are still in the team. That's why we've, you know, it's part of the reason why we value them is that they bring those skill sets and, of course, their personalities. We have to praise their efforts, that they tried really hard, that they put in the extra hours, that they slogged it at night. That's what people find more motivating, according to her research. So I don't want to go into this in too much detail. You're more than welcome to have a look on the internet. But on the left-hand side, you've got fixed mindset. And, and I found a really nice picture that said agile mindset rather than growth mindset. So I zapped it for you. Um, and so on the left are people who avoid failure. I don't really want to spot the cow anymore. It's too bad. They don't want to look at challenges because they don't want to fail. How sad is that? And without failure, there's no innovation. Um, and on the other hand, there's people who want to take risks and, and, you know, dive in and make a mistake, really mess up and, you know, with risk mitigation behind you. But we, we, we are happy to, to take risks and fail because we get the lesson. We're not afraid of that. We're not afraid of getting feedback from people who have our backs. So I'm going to ask you to finish to swap the words or to rephrase them using a more agile mindset. So you're a leader. And so instead of you saying, well, I'm not good at this, or if you hear somebody else that you coach or that you manage saying, I'm really not good at this, what should be the thinking instead? Who wants to have a go? Where can I learn to do this? Yep. Great. Thanks, Jay. So we can say, well, what am I missing? You know, what's the missing piece? Where can I get that information from? Instead of saying, oh, I give up. What could we say? Yep, I can be better at this. I can do better. Great. Um, I'll just, you know, choose a different route. It's not good enough. What could we say? 
Ooh, let's try another approach, another angle. Yes, great, you're getting it. That's it. I made progress. What's the next step? How might I iterate now? Yeah. Is this really my best work? What else can I do? I'm looking at it through a growth lens. Okay, and we work, that's enough for now, but um, there's, there's a few more and I'll, I'll send them to you. Things that we hear often, this client is too hard. Well, we will put some more effort in. Never been my strength or someone's better at this than I am. And so if we have an opportunity to help people develop this agile mindset, we should be doing it because this is what's going to take us out of the doldrums of negative thinking. Negative thinking has never got us anywhere. Um, we, we need to really stretch people to want to try harder. And, and that's why I've got my poster behind it. I'm not sure if you can see it, but Simon Sinek on leadership, such a growth mindset phrase of his. The goal is not to be perfect by the end. The goal is be better today. And I love Simon Sinek. And somebody had courage, and it's come up a number of times today. And this is our sixth of um, our six steps. It's number six. To, and I love this visual about taking a different course because that's what courage is. Um, some scenarios that we have to show up with in a courageous way. Um, can anyone tell me, like, why is courage important for leadership now? When do we need to show courage? It's twofold, I guess. It's expressing what other people are thinking in a loud voice. That's important. And the yeah. other one, speaking up against the tide as well in matters that are ethical, require empathy, require direction. Yes, and it might not be the popular voice in the room, Amani, but you have every right to express that. And you might get backlash, um, but it's okay. Have you, ever, have you ever made the unpopular vote on a panel or an unpopular yeah. vote in a board meeting? Definitely. <laughs> and that's courage, right? You've got to make the hard calls, as Louise says. You know, sometimes we have to give feedback to somebody. We don't really want to give feedback to them because it's a tough conversation. Um, and, and, and there will be um, a little bit of defensiveness. Even casting a vision amongst ambiguity takes courage, says Suzanne. Absolutely. You might want to change direction mid-project or, or move a deadline. Um, you know, looking at risks um, and project plans, setting goals for people, even if it's a, it's a career goal, that takes courage as well. Sometimes using... Um, the video function on Zoom takes courage <laughs> for some people. So um, what, what I think is important here is the lesson for leaders. So what can you do, right? You're gonna go back to work tomorrow, businesses as, um, as best as we can make it at the moment, which I think is, is fabulous because we are all st still working in some way, is to build what Brene Brown calls your inner circle. Now, if you're a fan of Brene Brown, I'm a fan of yours. And um, she speaks about the inner circle being the very people who, um, coming back to our first question, who trusts you, it's uh, the reciprocal relationship that you have with these people, that they trust you and you trust them. You have each other's back. That's in your inner circle. These are not the 10 people that you invited in a party. These are two or three people who you know have your best interests. They are people who will call you out on bad behavior and say, can I talk to you for just two minutes? You know, when you mentioned that thing in the meeting, you said it in a tone of voice. I noticed that was a little bit harsh. The impact of that was blah. And so what do you think? Oh, and you're open to that feedback because they're in your inner circle and rather than getting defensive. So I'm going to suggest that everybody thinks very hard about, hmm, do I have a circle? And if I don't, who should be in my inner circle and start building what we call your trusted advisors. And um, something else which we think is important is to actually go out and seek feedback from these people. Not every day. I mean, that's a, not an easy job for somebody to always be harassed for feedback. But when the, t when the stakes are high, 
um, to ask for feedback and make tough decisions. Sometimes you are gonna to need to make decisions that you're scared to make, just do it anyway. Just do it anyway, even if you're scared out of your wits, because if you just stay still, you're not growing. And you will never know if it's gonna work unless you try. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity and change. That's a quote from Brene Brown. And she says that the worst thing that you can have as a leader, which will hold you back for as long as you are leading other people, is any armor that you have. People hate that. They want to see you. If you have armor up, it leads to defensiveness, attack, um, you're shielding yourself against feedback, and you're not growing, and, you, and there's a little bit of too much ego going on. She says, just let go of the armor um, and be brave. She's written some great books and I encourage you to have a look at which one um, you'd like to uh, research if this is something that appeals to you. And I think um, what's, what's really apparent is that during the pandemic, people are looking for heroes um, and not heroes of medals, but sort of quiet confidence and quiet strength in making decisions that are tough um, and sticking by them. You know, you cannot go back on a decision. You can know that it's not the popular route, but make the decision and stick with it. And that's, that can be really hard for a leader. Okay, so if anyone would like to share with us um, a, a story, a quick example perhaps of something that you've done in the last month, which is courageous, then please type that into chat or take yourself off mute, put your hand up and we'll unmute you. Who's done something courageous? While we're thinking, Louise, I think that this, um, I know we're only at sort of 20 to four, but I think that the sea of, yes, you took the words out of my mouth. Establishing the PMO symposium has been a brave move. You stuck, you stuck by it. It's happening um, and people are enjoying it. And I think um, kudos to you. So I'd like to hear from everybody now. If you haven't chatted yet, this is your opportunity. Be courageous and type a word into chat for me. And, the, and the, what I'm looking for is which of these six steps do you plan to do or implement or work on immediately? And if you look back sort of in your rear view mirror at this 45 minutes, you'll see that the six steps are executionary. Some are more executionary in their, um, in their, in their, um, their vibe or their energy. Um, and some are much more emotional. And so it's very important for leaders to get that balance right. And that's also, I mean, no one ever said leadership was easy, but for a leader to balance execution and emotion, that's what makes the role hard in my mind. So I'm interested to see which of the six steps you plan to um, enhance in the next few days. Okay, so we've got can one. You pop them, can you pop them up again, Kerry, for people? The six steps, have you got a slide with them all on? I will type them. Let's see who can remember them with me. What's number one? This is the best part. What's the first one? Purpose. What's number two? Empathy. What's number three? There's resilience. There's communicate clearly, simply. There was the growth mindset. Empathy and courage. Have we got them all? It was very good guys, one. And of course, I'm gonna just add trust because that underpins everything. Now, can I hear from everybody? What do you think is missing from your repertoire or just needs a little bit of polishing that you promise you are going to work on? <laughs> That's hilarious, Gillian. Yeah, tackle resilience. And you saw the cow first, but you hate when you can't, yeah. So, um, it's about keeping, keeping what my mother says, keep on keeping on. Uh, it didn't make sense to me <laughs> when I was a teenager, but it makes sense to me as I'm aging. If you just keep trying, 
something will happen. Something good will happen. It's impossible for it not to. That's the law of the universe. One of the laws of the universe. Okay, everybody. Um, so um, as we draw to a close, I'm going to take courage and ask you that if anything isn't clear or you'd like to know more about a particular topic, will you please get in touch with me? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, there's a phone number. But the reason is that every single one of these six steps is in fact a workshop on its own and can really be delved into at length. And um, I'm happy to chat to you more about any of these topics if you'd like to. So please get a hold of me. Um, Louise will send these out as well, I imagine. Yep. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for the opportunity to address everybody and have a bit of fun. And that's, and that's all from me. I wish everybody the best of luck.